Welcome to High Content Screening for Identifying MicroRNAs Inducing Cardiac Regeneration and Assessing Compound Toxicity. I'm Tamlin Oliver, Managing Editor of Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology News, and I'll be the moderator for this webinar. Researchers the world over rely on high content screening to obtain detailed knowledge about targets or compounds of interest at the cellular level. Recently, it has been discovered that high content screening is also useful in identifying molecules that affect cardiomyocyte differentiation and development, as well as in assess assessing their toxic effects on these cells. The three speakers in this webinar will discuss how high content screening can be used to assess microRNA-induced neonatal cardiomyocyte proliferation in vitro, how it can be applied to evaluate restorative properties of microRNA after myocardial infarction in vivo, and also how it can be applied to cardiac safety testing of pharmacologic compounds. If you're curious about the benefits of using high-content screening in your cardiomyocyte-related work, stay tuned. Our panelists will tell you what you need to know and then answer any questions you might have. Our first speaker is Miguel Mano, scientific Manager, High Throughput Screening Facility, Research Scientist, Molecular Medicine Laboratory at the International Center for Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology in Italy. Miguel will present a systematic identification of microRNAs that promote proliferation of neonatal cardiomyocytes. Before he kicks off his presentation, though, I want to encourage you to submit questions for our Q&A session at the end of the presentations. We'll answer as many questions as we can. Simply type your question into the Ask a Question box and hit Submit. Miguel, we're ready for you. Okay, so welcome to this webinar. My name is Miguel Mano, and today I will show you our recent work using high content screening to identify microRNAs inducing cardiac regeneration. So I work at the International Center for Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology, ICGAP, in Trieste, Italy, and I'm the responsible for the output screening facility here. So the main goal of our screening facility is to perform RNAi screening, and for that, we have available for screening both a human genome-wide sRNA library as well as a, uh, as well as a mouse uh, genome-wide sRNA library, and also human microRNA libraries of mimics and inhibitors. So although some of the work that we do is based on plate reader-based assays, most of the work that we are now doing is based on eye content screening. So eye content screening is a very, very powerful technique and in this slide, you can see just a few examples of high content assays that we run in the lab. So from top to bottom, you can see, for example, looking at the reported gene expression, nucleocytoplasmic translocation of a protein of interest, infection by a virus, and in the bottom, cell proliferation, which is the screening I will be talking to you today um, uh, in the case of the, the cardiomyocytes. But before that, a few words about uh, cardiovascular diseases. So cardiovascular diseases are the number one cause of death globally, with estimates ranging in the order of 20 million deaths per year. So the main cause of these diseases uh, is uh, the incapacity of the adult heart to regenerate after uh, a damage and to reverse this way uh, most forms of heart disease. So in the left-hand side, you can see a recent work by the Richard Lee's laboratory showing that, indeed, the capacity of the cardiomyocytes to proliferate strongly decreases from newborn to adult and from adult to old animals. So considerable effort has been put into development of different strategies aiming at restoring uh, myocardial mass by inducing cardiac regeneration, and this includes, includes mobilization of stem cells, engraftment of donor myocytes, de novo cardiomyogenesis, and our approach, which was uh, to try to induce cardiomyocyte proliferation. So our starting question was, can microRNAs promote cardiomyocyte proliferation? So microRNAs are a class of genome-encoded small regulatory uh, RNAs. There are about 2,000 microRNAs identified in humans, slightly less in mouse and in rats, and they silence the expression of partially complementary target messengers. So one very important thing is that each microRNA is predicted to regulate hundreds of target messengers, and on the other way, on the other way, multiple microRNAs can regulate the same target messenger. So microRNAs have been involved 
in a wide uh, variety of biological processes, such as development, cellular differentiation, cell proliferation, apoptosis, several forms of diseases, and also viral and bacterial infections. Not surprisingly, they have also been related to different aspects of cardiac function and dysfunction. And in this slide, you can see just some of the microRNAs that have been described to affect, for example, um, hypertrophy, fibrosis, um, conduction, and several other aspects of cardiac biology. So, to identify microRNAs uh, inducing cardiomyocyte proliferation, we did a screening starting from a library of uh, microRNA mimics arrayed on 96 cell plates. So these were about 1,000 sequences corresponding to MIRBASE 13, and these libraries were from Darmacon. So we transfected these microRNAs into cardiomyocytes isolated from newborn rat, and then 52 hours after the transfection, we added EDU to the cells. EDU is a nucleotide analog that gets incorporated into the DNA during DNA synthesis. And so 20 hours after, that is three days after the transfection, we fixed the cells and we treated them for um, the fluorescent staining. So we did staining for us, for the nuclei, alpha-actinine for the cardiomyocytes, K67, which is a proliferation marker, and also for the EDU. And we acquired the images and then analyzed these images using an image express micro. So this is how a negative control looks like in our experiments. So in the left-hand side, you can see the original image taken by the microscope. And on the right-hand side, you can see the result of the analysis by the software. So in blue, on the left-hand side, you can see the nucleus staining with dust. And in green, cells uh, standing for alpha-actinine, which is a marker of cardiomyocytes. And the red nucleus are nucleus of proliferating cells that have incorporated EDU. So you can see that there are some cells that are proliferating that are not green positive, and so they are not cardiomyocytes. They are mostly fibroblasts. And you also can see some cells that are green and they all have their nucleus red, and these are the proliferating cardiomyocytes. So in these negative controls, which are cells treated with, C with the C. elegans microRNA, in this case, C. elegans microRNA 67, in basal conditions, neonatal cells have a proliferation capacity of about 12.5%. So this number comes from the analysis of 16 images that we analyzed for microRNA and per replicate, which accounts for about 3,000 miles, uh, 3,000 cells for each experimental condition. So in this slide, you can see the results of the screening that we performed. So here I'm showing the results for the 1,000 microRNAs in terms of proliferation. And you can see in red, uh, the microRNAs that increase proliferation by more than twofold. These are the results for two replicates. And in blue, the microRNA is that decrease proliferation of the cardiomyocytes by more than uh, twofold. And here you can see some, some examples of the microRNA that increase proliferation. So now you see, for example, for microRNA 800, 1825, you see a very massive increase in cell proliferation. Much more of the nucleus are now stained uh, red. And the same is true for the other microRNA. And here I'm showing you two microRNAs that decrease the proliferation of the myocytes. So in this image, it's very difficult to find a cardiomyocyte that is proliferating. So then what we decided to do was to take these 200 microRNAs that we tested initially in rats and then retest these microRNAs in mouse cardiomyocytes. And so we did this for two reasons. The first reason is that the mouse cardiomyocytes proliferate in basal conditions less than the rat uh, cardiomyocytes. So it's slightly harder to make a, a mouse cardiomyocyte proliferate than a rat cardiomyocyte. The other, the other reason was that we wanted to find microRNAs the, the, that the action would be conserved across species. So if the microRNA works in rats and in mouse, it's more likely that it will also work in humans. So we redid the screening in mouse cardiomyocytes, and we end up with about 40 microRNAs that increase proliferation of both mouse and rat by more than twofold. So until now, I have only shown you data on um, DNA synthesis. 
So this is not true uh, proliferation. So are these microRNAs also able to induce really uh, cell proliferation? And so to address this, what we did was on this set of 40 microRNAs to do more stringent assays looking at later phases of the cell cycle. And so instead of using EDU and K67 as we used in the initial screening, we used now um, phosphorylated A-stone H3 and also a localization of Aurora B into mid-bodies. So here I'm showing you some of the results for some of the microRNAs, and you can see uh, immediately the treatment of the cardiomyocytes now in red with, uh, in this case, microRNA 593B. You see much more cells positive for histone H3, phosphorylated at serine 10, which is a, a marker of uh, late G2 mitosis. And this we could observe both in rat and in mouse cells for a series of microRNAs. And here I'm just showing you the results for some of these microRNAs. So the same is true for Aurora B localization in two mid-bodies. Two mid-bodies are these structures that you can see in the left bottom um, square that are uh, the smoking gun of cell division. So the, these, these structures are from, do, are from doing cytokinesis, and so they are the, the formal proof that the cells have divided. And so again, treatment of the cardiomyocytes with the microRNAs led to a significant increase in the adherence of these of these structures, and this again we observed in rats and in mouse with different microRNAs that we have tested. So because we are looking at cell proliferation, one expect that if the cells proliferate more, we have to have more cells in the wells when we look at the, at the, the wells. And so this is indeed what we see. So in the left hand side, I am showing you the results of the screening, where you can already appreciate a trend that the cells that uh, proliferate more, the number of the cells uh, is higher, but this is much more clear if you if you we wait more time, so we give six days uh, of the of the microRNAs to to exert their action, and so then you can see on the right hand side a very strong difference between the the control microRNAs and the cells treated with the microRNAs that we identified using this screening. So one very important point, and this is one advantage when we're using high content screening, is that we can um, distinguish between different populations in the well. So in this case, we were able to distinguish between the cardiomyocytes and the non-cardiomyocytes that are mostly uh, fibroblasts. And so it's also very critical to understand whether the microRNAs that we identified have an effect in the fibroblasts because fibrosis is not desirable under these uh, conditions. We want to promote specific the proliferation of cardiomyocytes. And so here you can see the results uh, I'm showing you uh, proliferation of fibroblasts against proliferation of cardiomyocytes. And you can see that the microRNAs that induce the proliferation of the cardiomyocytes have no effect on the proliferation of fibroblasts. Also very important is to understand whether these microRNAs have an effect of cardiomyocyte size. Now, hypertrophy can be a problem, and so we wanted to be sure that the microRNAs that we are selecting as increasing proliferation were not affecting the area of the cells. So again, because we are doing this screening by eye content, we can have all the measures from the cells, including the area of the cells. And so we could see for all the microRNAs that we tested with what was the effect on the area, and we observed, again, that the microRNAs that we selected based on proliferation had no effect on the size of the cells. Of course, we identified microRNAs that increase uh, the area of the cells, so they are pro-hypertrophic, and also microRNAs that have the opposite effect, but these were not the ones uh, that increased more uh, the, the proliferation of the cells. So another very interesting question is whether these microRNAs can induce the proliferation also of quiescent cardiomyocytes. So all the work that I've shown you so far is using neonatal cells. So these cells have still a residual capacity to proliferate, and so it's, it's easier to extend this proliferation window than to actually to promote cells that is quiescent uh, and to induce them to, to proliferate. And so our first approach to look into this, we decided to isolate cells from seven-day-old rats so as I told you in the beginning, the proliferation of the cardiomyocytes decreases very rapidly after birth. So you can see here that in rats that 
uh, in the newborns, the proliferation was about 12%. Seven-day-old uh, rats, the proliferation of the cardiomyocytes is below 1%. So again, we tested these microRNAs into this cell, and we could observe that the microRNAs that we have tested strongly increased the proliferation also of these cells that were no longer proliferating. And here I'm just showing you some of the examples that were the microRNAs that we explored uh, further. So even more challenging is try to induce the proliferation of a completely differentiated cell isolated from an adult animal. So this was exactly what we tested. And so we isolated the cells from adult uh, rats. We put these cells in culture, and these cells don't proliferate at all. But when we introduced these microRNAs, in this case, uh, the microRNA 590, 3P, and 199HPP, we could see, again, a very strong increase in proliferation, it's showing that these microRNAs are also able to induce the proliferation of fully differentiated adult cells. So for the rest of my talk, I will focus on these two microRNAs, which were the microRNAs that we ultimately um, took into an in vivo setup. So but before, what are the targets of these microRNAs? So identifying a microRNA is not enough because the, the, the microRNA may have uh, several targets. So to identify the relevant targets of these two microRNAs, what we decided to do was to take an experimental approach and so overexpress these microRNAs into mouse cardiomyocytes and then do a transcriptomic analysis. The idea here being that the messengers that are downregulated in the presence of the microRNA are at the likely targets of these microRNAs. So by doing this, we identified about 700 messenger uh, RNAs that were downregulated that corresponded to uh, 641 genes. And then to understand the, the, the importance of each of these genes to the phenotype, what we decided to do was to do a target sRNA screening, silencing these genes one by one to see if any of these knockdowns could phenocopy the microRNA and so uh, tell us what were the most relevant uh, targets of the microRNA. So by doing this, we identified 45 genes that once knocked down increased proliferation of the cardiomyocytes by more than twofold. But what was really interesting was that uh, none of the sRNAs by themselves could lead to a proliferation similar to that induced by the microRNA. So you can see here that several genes, once knocked down, increased proliferation by more than twofold. But uh, we, the very strong effect that we see with the microRNA results from a combination of the silencing of more than one gene, because none of these uh, knockdowns could uh, reproduce the phenotype. So what was the effect of these microRNAs in vivo? So first, as a first approach to test the effect of these microRNAs in vivo, we used the synthetic microRNAs injected directly intracardiacally in a newborn rat. And we, and we look at DDO incorporation four days after the injection. So these were very short-term experiments. And as you can see here, uh, the quantification is on the left-hand side, and then you can see some uh, representative even images on the right-hand side. Treatment of these hearts with the microRNAs in vivo led, again, to a very significant increase in the number of cells incorporating EDU, so cells that are uh, proliferating. And if we now look at all heart sections of animals injected with these different microRNAs, so on the left, the control microRNA, and on the center and right, the two microRNAs that we selected, you, although you cannot see the EDU positivity here at this uh, level of magnification, you can appreciate that the walls of these arts treated with the microRNAs are thicker, and the arts are generally bigger, but this increase in size is not due to an increase in the size of the cells, but rather to an increase in the number of cells due to an increased uh, proliferation. And if we look in more detail, using confocal microscopy, you can see that the most of the cells that we see positive for EDU, so proliferating, are indeed cardiomyocytes. So you see this uh, red nucleus surrounded by a green uh, alpha actinin. There may be some cells that are not uh, cardiomyocytes, but the majority uh, for sure is. 
So to explore the long-term effects of the microRNAs uh, in these hearts, we decided uh, to use adeno-associated ve uh, vectors. So these are uh, vectors that have a very uh, good tropism for for the heart, who are very experienced in preparing these vectors uh, in the lab. And so they allow for a very uh, sustained expression of the trend genes uh, over the life of the, the animals. And so the first experiment that we did was to prepare these vectors encoding for the different microRNAs and inject them um, IP. And then 12 days after the injection, we look at the heart size. And again, as we saw before, we saw a very significant increase in the size of the hearts injected with the microRNAs. And this increase in the size is not due to an increase in the size of the cells because we measured the, the cardiomyocyte cross-sectional area. It's the graph, uh, the rightmost graph. Uh, but it's rather, again, to an increase in the number of cells. And if we look again in more detail, into these hearts we can see an increased proliferation, with an increase in the number of cells undergoing uh, mitosis. So the final question is whether these microRNAs can have any therapeutic value. So to address this, what we did was to induce a myocardial infarction in a mice model. And we, we did this by a ligation of the coronary artery that creates an ischemic area. And then we injected in the border zone of the infarction AVs encoding for the microRNAs or NAV uh, control. And then at different times after the infarction, we evaluated the scar size, the percentage of viable myocardium, and also cardiac function uh, using uh, echocardiography. So in this slide, I'm showing you the results. So this was a follow-up of uh, two months. And you can see these three groups of graphs uh, are three uh, parameters of our function. So from left to, to right, uh, a left ventricular ejectional fractioning, fractional shortening, and a thickness of the wall. And you can see that in the white bars, uh, the mice treated with a, the, the control uh, virus, they, they get worse with time, as you would expect, whereas animals treated with the AV encoding for the microRNAs, the function of the art was preserved. And the dashed lines that you can see are uh, the values for non-infected animals. So you can appreciate that treatment of the microRNAs almost completely rescued the cardiac function of these animals. So if you look at the histology of these hearts, we can see that the extension of the infarct at 12 and 60 days uh, is much reduced after uh, transaction with AV encoding for the microRNAs. So in this case, we're looking at the fibrotic uh, tissue that is stained in blue for collagen deposition, and you can see massive infarctions in animals treated with uh, controls, whereas treatment with microRNAs, you see a very um, reduced area of infarcted tissue. And if we look more carefully at the border zone of the infarction, we can see cells positive for DDU in the animals treated with the AV encoding uh, for the microRNAs, showing that at least part of the regenerative capacity uh, of these hearts was due to um, increased proliferation induced by, by the microRNAs. So to summarize, I showed you the results of high contact fluorescence microscopy screening to identify microRNAs control link cardiomyocyte proliferation. We identified 40 microRNAs that induce rat and mouse cardiomyocyte DNA replication and cytokinesis. We tested selected microRNAs and showed that they are effective in driving cardiomyocyte proliferation in vivo. And we uh, demonstrated that microRNA delivery in a model of myocardial infarction uh, rescues uh, art function to almost uh, normal uh, levels. So I have no time today to show you all the experiments we have performed, so I encourage you to have a look at our paper, which describes in detail all the work that I've presented to you today. And with that, I'd like to thank all the people that contributed to this work, in particular Anna Lalio, who was the key person in this project, and also Professor Mauro Jaka, that is the head of the Molecular Medicine Lab at the ICGB. I'd also like to thank Jen and Molecular Devices for organizing this webinar, and of course, all of you for your attention. 
I want also to remind you that there will be a Q&A session after the talks, and I'll be happy to take any questions you may have. Thank you very much. All right, Miguel, you took my line away from me. I was going to remind everyone about the questions. Thank you for your presentation, and thank you for reminding everyone. Our second speaker is Evan Cromwell, Director of Assay Development at Molecular Devices. Evan will describe high-content screening assays for measuring the impact of pharmacologic compounds on cardiomyocytes derived from stem cell sources. Evan, take it away. Okay, thank you, Tamlin. So now I'm going to switch gears a little bit. It was an excellent presentation by Miguel uh, talking about cardiac regeneration and how miRNAs can be used to induce cardiomyocyte proliferation. Here we're going to focus more on cardiac safety or uh, safety and toxicity using cardiomyocyte models, uh, specifically stem cell-derived models. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge the uh, scientists at, in my group at Molecular Devices who did this work, is Oksana Serenko, Jane Hesley, and Carol Crittenden. So my agenda will be uh, three parts. First, talk a little bit about in vitro toxicity testing, its importance to the drug discovery and development uh, industry and the use of stem cell models to try to improve in vitro tox testing. And then I'll give two examples. One is a more traditional high-content screening for cardiotoxicity, where we use high-content imaging and analysis to look for toxic effects on cardiomyocytes. And the second application would be a more novel contracting cardiomyocyte assay, where we use phenotypic uh, beating or uh, spontaneously contracting cardiomyocytes to try to look for toxic effects. And as I'll show data, this is a much more sensitive way of looking for cardiotoxic effects of compounds. As Miguel mentioned, cardiac disease is the number one killer in the world, and cardiotoxicity is the number one drug safety failure of compounds, either in preclinic or clinical trials or for drugs that have been released to the public. Uh, some classic examples are Vioxx or uh, Cisapride, which were withdrawn from market at cost of billions of dollars to not only the uh, companies involved in bringing those to market, but also the effect on the people who uh, had uh, toxic effects from those compounds. So the industry has really been focused on this as a way to improve the efficiency of bringing drugs to market. And the two things they're focused on are, one, improved cell-based models, allowing you to look at more complex biology. And one of the models that we'll be talking about is iPSC-derived cardiomyocytes. And the second is really advancements in assay techniques and instrumentation. How can you improve the instrumentation, the hardware, the software, and the assays itself to give you more predictive information? The NIH has, in 2005, started the TOX21 initiative. And there they really wanted to improve predictive toxic toxicity. Uh, the gold standard has been in vivo animal testing, but they wanted to move the industry to in vitro cell-based assays, and this will reduce animal use and cost. It will allow more high-content screening or, or, or more high-throughput screening for toxicity testing if you can do your toxicity testing in multi-well plates and allows you then to evaluate mechanisms of toxicity and look for dose response um, and really increase the amount of information you can get on compounds that are moving through the drug discovery and into clinical trials. As I mentioned, one of the new models is stem cell-derived cell models. And stem cells have been studied for, for many, many years. Um, and there are a lot of efforts going on improving the uh, ability to expand and differentiate uh, stem cells into cardiomyocytes, uh, neurons, uh, hematopoietic cells, or other uh, tissues. Um, and a lot of focus has been on uh, improving the purity of the cells as well as the maturity of the cells derived from stem cells. And I show a number of companies that uh, we've been working with who provide either uh, pluripotent cells or fully differentiated um, and mature uh, cells derived from stem cells. High content imaging has played a very important part in this. And here we're showing a use for looking for differentiation of induced pluripotent stem cells to cardiomyocytes. 
So in the undifferentiated state, there are a number of stem cell markers, for example, OCT4, that are highly expressed. Why in the differentiated state, for cardiomyocytes in this example, you see the uh, expression of actinin and the down regulation of OCT4 and other markers. The automatic capture of the images and the stains can be done in a multiplex manner, so you can look for multiple markers, and you can quantify the extent of the differentiation um, and the percent that have been uh, differentiated to the molecules or to the cells of interest. Now on this slide, we show how we can quantify that using our MedExpress software and the cell scoring algorithm. So on the left, you see a variety of stem cell markers where we've quantified the percent of cells expressing those markers in a well. This is all done in three to four well plates. And as we differentiate the cells using uh, known uh, formulations, you can see the increase in the cardiomyocyte markers of troponin, actinin, etc. You can do this on average, or you can do a cell-by-cell -cell analysis. So you can really get detailed information on each cell and the maturity of that cell. You can also visualize your cells. And here we're showing examples of fully differentiated cardiomyocytes looking at troponin and actinin stains using our ImageQuest Micro XL system. And the industry is using these type of assays now to do screens for small molecules that promote differentiation of cells to cardiomyocytes or hepatocytes, uh, for example, um, and screening hundreds of thousands of compounds to look for those that will improve the percent differentiation. If you're just using growth factors and other methods, you can maybe get up to 30, 40% differentiation into specific cell types, for example, cardiomyocytes. But there's been examples shown where you can find small molecules that uh, in combination with the growth factors can improve that differentiation efficiency up to 60, 70% and perhaps even more. So this is a, a very important area as uh, the industry is looking for improvement in techniques to generate cardiomyocytes. So I'll switch gears a little bit and talk about how we can use now fully differentiated cardiomyocytes. And these are uh, induced pluripotent stem cell derived cardiomyocytes that we received from Cellular Dynamics. Um, and this is an example of a short term toxicity assay using JC10 and looking at mitochondrial integrity as an early indicator of cell distress. On the left side, you can see in the control image uh, healthy cells where you have the J aggregates in the mitochondria and expressing uh, orange stain. But as the membrane potential is disrupted, these change into JC10 monomeric form and turn green. And so by using various modules, analysis modules, you can quantify the granularity of the aggregates and they're changing color from orange to green. A second type of assay is looking for longer-term toxicity effects. Here we're doing a multi-parametric toxicity assay, and this can be used for treated for 24, 48, 72 hours, or even longer. This is using three different stains. We're using calcine AM to look for cell viability. We're looking at MitoTracker Orange to look at mitochondrial integrity, and Hurst for nuclear stain to look for nuclear morphology. Here we can see Ida Rubison treatment showing degradation of the cells as expected. And you can look for various parameters. You can get up to 20 to 30 parameters from this. Uh, here we're just looking at the number of viable cells, and we can see dose response of the various compounds tested here with different molecular targets. I'll call your attention to haloperidol, where we see no toxicity effect or cell on cell viability, but this is a known HER blocker and has cardiotoxic effects uh, in vivo. So we moved from doing traditional high content screening, which has um, some indications of early toxicity, to what we believe is a more sensitive assay. And here we're using the spontaneously contracting cardiomyocytes. If you take cardiomyocytes, for example, the eye cell cardiomyocytes, you plate them in a 96 or 384 well plate, let them mature for 7 to 10 days, they'll start spontaneously contracting. Here we can visualize those contractions using calcium M, and you can see the mechanical movement of the cells. And then we can use differential image processing 
to look for that movement and associating with each uh, peak in the derivative uh, a beat or a contraction event. And by manually counting those, you can look for a response of different compounds on the beat rate of those cells. Here we show examples of epinephrine and isoproteranol, which are known positive chronotropes, which increase the beat rate accordingly. Now, this is a fairly manually intensive analysis, so we're looking for a, a improved method for measuring the contractions and something that would be amenable to a high-throughput screen. So we loaded the cells with calcium-sensitive dyes, and this is a known effect going discovered back in the uh, early 90s after Roger Chen uh, developed the calcium-sensitive dyes, um, that spontaneously contracting cardiomyocytes or contracting cardiomyocytes um, have intracellular calcium fluxes, which can be measured with these sensitive dyes. Um, these have been shown to be physiologically relevant, um, and we can then use these to do an integration of intensity, and those curves are shown beneath each of the movies. And so if you look on the left, you can see the control beating at a regular rate, and this is typically 30 to 40 beats per minute uh, for these particular uh, cell types. If we add in epinephrine, which is a known positive chronotrope, we can see an increase in that beat rate. As well, if we add in verapamil with known positive negative chronotrope, we see a dramatic decrease in, in the beat rate, and the time scales of those three graphs are, are identical. So here we now have a cell model, the iPSC-derived cardiomyocytes, which are responding in a predictive manner and provide very good sensitivity um, and very good signals to noise, so a basis for a, a good assay. And if we then compare this assay, which is monitoring the uh, perturbation of the contraction rates, to the viability assay, we can see a dramatic increase in sensitivity. For example, in haloperidol, where we saw no toxicity at all in our cell viability assay, we now see a uh, IC50 of around 22 uh, nanomolar. Other compounds, too, we see dramatic decreases in the IC50s uh, for toxic effects or perturbations of, of beating rate. There are limitations to doing this on a microscope system, we can measure one well at a time using the system. Um, so we've uh, developed methods on our Flipper Tetra system, which is a whole plate imaging system doing fast kinetic measurements. So now we can integrate the signal from a well um, at a time, and we can do a whole plate in about 90 seconds. And so now, again, you can transform this assay into a system which is amenable to high throughput. This is also a high content because not only are we looking at the beat rate, we're looking at multiple other parameters um, from the toxicity and doing this automatically with our Streamworks Peak Pro software. So in this screen, I just show some uh, standard responses that we get using Flipper system, showing it's um, very similar to the MSPS micro system. And we can also, as I mentioned, measure other parameters. Here we're comparing peak width at the 10% amplitude to peak spacing. And so we can see the control wells um, uh, have very regular spacing. In fact, we get about 10% to 15% CVs uh, well to well for our control. And we can see with isoproteranol and epinephrine, not only do we get a decrease in peak spacing, an uh, increase in peak rate, but a change in peak width. And then for compounds as a cisbride, you see a very dramatic change in the peak width. And cisbride is a known Herg channel blocker. It um, delays the repolarization of the contraction event, and so you see a very long e elongated peak width uh, for this compound. And you can see the other Herg blockers, such as estemazole, uh, pimazide, which also cause an increase in the uh, peak width. Um, some other um, compounds like lidocaine, which is a sodium channel blocker, uh, can interrupt the beating, although it doesn't have an effect on the peak width or the elongation. So now by looking at these multiple parameters, we can start characterizing the different types of um, effects of compounds and mechanism of actions. And as we are doing more work on this, the question becomes, is this a predictive assay or can this be a predictive assay? 
And so these results are um, presented in the Journal of Biomedical Screen article that came out this year where we're comparing the uh, cardiac car cardiomyocyte contraction assay with other cardio models, um, the, the electrophysiology or animal models. And we're actually seeing very good concordance of our beating cardiomyocyte assay uh, to these other assay models. Uh, we have another paper in press where we're screening a, a small compound library and using that to look for predictivity. And we can see predictivities of better than 80% uh, for this particular assay over that small compound library. So the early indications are very um, favorable for this assay as being a predictive model uh, for cardiac toxicity in vitro. So in summary, I'd like to just uh, reiterate the usefulness of high content imaging for looking at differentiation and monitoring maturity of cardiomyocytes and other stem cell derived models. Um, there is, I mentioned, a number of companies uh, industry, in the industry doing screens for small molecules to promote differentiation expansion and look for maturity of cardiomyocytes to try to improve the um, number of cardiomyocytes and the, and the purity of these um, cardiomyocytes. Uh, we've shown the, uh, that these are very promising model for doing predictive cardiotoxicity, either using multi-parametric cell viability assays or using the novel contracting cardiomyocyte assays, which shows higher sensitivity uh, to different compounds. Um, we've done the small library compound testing using our Flipper Tetra system. Um, those work should be published later this year. Um, and we're seeing very good predictivity with that. And we're also working with another number of other um, collaborators, both in industry and academia, um, to really show the true predictivity, predictive value of this um, assay. And lastly, the image test micro is a very valuable tool uh, for identifying cardiotoxic compounds. It can automatically acquire and analyze your images. I think Miguel showed an example of that in his uh, his talk earlier. Um, so a very powerful tool for uh, automating these type of uh, analyses and, and assays. So last, I'd like to acknowledge the, again, the uh, scientists who really did the work, uh, Oksana Sorenko, uh, Jane Hesley, Carol Crittenden, uh, as well as our friends at Cell Dynamics who provided the iCell cardiomyocytes for this work and Ivan Russin at University of North Carolina, uh, who's in the environmental toxicology area. And thank you very much for your attention. Thanks, Evan. Our third and final speaker is Vicki Rassicott, Field Application Scientist, Cellular Imaging at Molecular Devices. Vicki will talk about the HCS solutions available from Molecular Devices. Uh, Vicki, you're up. Thank you so much, Tamlin, and thank you again for joining us. As we've seen very powerfully illustrated in both Miguel and Evan's talks, incorporating a high content screening approach can greatly enhance capability of answering questions to drive your cardiac regeneration and toxicity studies, both for research and drug discovery applications. Molecular Devices offers a complete solution allowing researchers to very easily integrate a high content screening approach into their research plans. The data highlighted in today's talks was generated largely on the Image Express Micro Wide Field High Content Screening System. This is an automated benchtop wide field imager which can be fitted with either a standard CCD or advanced scientific CMOS camera for an expanded dynamic range and three times larger field of view. The system is also fitted with a high-speed laser autofocus, which allows the instrument to find focus across your samples without impacting sample quality, a number of light source options, as well as user configurable optics, including the capability to fit the system with up to five filter cubes, allowing the researcher to access a broad variety of floors, as well as up to four Nikon objectives at any given time, ranging from 1x to 100x, both air and oil, which allows the researcher to access both research-grade imaging and high-throughput imaging capabilities in a single system. The micro can be used to image samples in everything from slides to 1536 well plates, again giving you the flexibility to perform both research imaging as well as high-throughput imaging. 
The basic system can be fitted with a number of options to accommodate your needs, including onboard single-channel fluidics, which is important for addressing high um, live imaging of biology, such as the cardiomyocyte beating assay, which Evan highlighted in his talk, that require onboard delivery of compound and immediate visualization of their effects. The system can also be fitted with true humidified CO2 and temperature control for long-term live cell imaging. We can sustain live cell imaging for up to five days continuously with our system without impacting cell health. This platform is also completely automation friendly and can be incorporated with any number of robotic arms to enable higher throughput applications. The software package that drives both image acquisition and analysis is called Meta Express. It's based in Metamorph, which is one of the most well-loved and well-vetted image analysis programs in the field. To analyze your images once they're required, we offer a comprehensive toolbox of image analysis tools, ranging from pre-configured turnkey application modules on one end of the spectrum to our very powerful journaling macros that allow for extremely uh, exquisite custom analysis. Bridging those two capabilities, we also offer now the capability to build custom modules with our custom module editor, providing unrivaled flexibility across the entire analysis continuum. This next slide illustrates some examples of our pre-configured turnkey application modules, ranging from everything from the most common cell scoring type assays to cell cycle measurements to measuring our toxicity endpoints with our micronuclei assay. These can be multiplexed to address hundreds of applications. And again, our custom module editor allows for unrivaled flexibility to build your own custom modules to address questions that fall a bit outside of our pre-configured modules capabilities. As we see in the example here, where we've multiplexed measurements of mitotic spindle morphology with centrosome counting. Our image Imaging platforms and software fall within our complete solution. We can see in the panel on the left our Image Express Micro at the top, which is the system that we've highlighted applications from today. For applications that require confocal imaging, we offer a complementary platform, the Image Express Ultra, as well as capability to analyze images collected on third-party imaging systems, including standalone microscopes. In the center, correlating all of our imaging data, our metadata as well as the numerical data derived from those images, we have our meta, our MDC stored database uh, management solution, which talks to both our instruments as well as our image analysis software. Again, MetaExpress drives both image analysis, acquisition and analysis, and can be paired with our MetaExpress Power Core software solution, which allows the researcher to access the power of parallel processing to accelerate image analysis with either our turnkey application modules or our custom modules. On the back end, in the lower right-hand corner of this slide, we have uh, our Acuity Express software package, which is a data mining package allowing the researcher to generate everything from IC50 curves to principal components analyses, linking those data points back to the original images from which they were derived with our MDC Earth feature. With that, I'd like to invite you to visit our website, www.moleculardevices.com, as well as to uh, please contact us with any questions you may have around the system, software, or applications. Uh, in addition to, uh, we'll be available at the end of this WebEx to uh, address any questions you may have in the immediate future. Thank you again, and again, please let us know if you have any questions. Thanks, Amy. And yes, please do let us know if you have any questions because we're about to begin our Q&A session. So please, if you do have any questions, type them into the Ask a Question box and hit Submit. Before we start the Q&A, though, I want to let you know that we're going to have a post-webinar survey. It will deploy shortly in the Presentation Manager. You might need to make sure you don't have your pop-ups disabled. Um, take a few minutes and respond to the survey. Your comments are extremely valuable to us. All right, we're ready to start the Q&A. We have a lot of good questions, and we'll answer as many as we can. Our first question is for Miguel. Miguel, why a library of microRNAs and not siRNAs or chemical compounds? So thanks for the question. Uh, yeah, that, that's a good question. Uh, so, so as you know, microRNAs have been involved in a lot of different biological processes, and the reason for this is that microRNAs 
are master regulators of, of gene expression. And, and so you have seen that when we overexpress two microRNAs, we saw a complete change in gene expression program. So we saw more than uh, 1,000 genes going up or down. And so the, I think this is the power of using microRNAs, and that was uh, why we used microRNAs to do this switch in the cardiomyocytes and making them to proliferate, and this would not have been possible using either drugs or uh, sRNA libraries. Miguel, have you tested human stem cell-derived cardiomyocytes in your miRNA screen? Well, we did not test them in our screen. We did test after the screening and after we identified the most um, potent um, candidates. Uh, we did this using the ES-derived cardiomyocytes from GE Healthcare, and indeed we saw that um, most of the microRNAs, of the top microRNAs, increase also the, the proliferation of these human cells, yes. Okay, Miguel, we have a lot of questions about your research. The next one is, you mentioned that MIR590 only targets cardiomyocytes and does not affect other cell types such as fibroblast. What regulates myocyte-specific targeting of the miRNA? Well, the, that is a, a very difficult question to, to answer. We don't know exactly what's going, uh, so why the microRNA 590 and 199 are specific for the cardiomyocytes. Uh, one thing that we see is that among the targets of the microRNA, there are proteins involved in muscle uh, differentiation and muscle organization. So it may be the case that these microRNAs are targeting these uh, contractile apparatus or some other organization of these muscle cells, and so this triggers then uh, the re-enter of the cells into the cycle, and that's why they are specific for the myocytes and not for uh, fibroblasts as we have seen. So this is a possibility. The other possibility is that, of course, the major targets of the microRNAs or the clue targets are not expressed in the fibroblasts and many other possibilities, but this is just one, of, one possibility. All right, Miguel, do any CROs use your system for cardiac talks on a fee-for-service basis? Well, I think that is probably a question for, for Evan. Uh, I don't have knowledge about that. Okay. Sorry. Well, Evan, actually, we'll move on to you. Do you want to answer that question, or do you want me to move on to some of the other ones? Um, yeah, I'm not uh, really right. aware of CROs using our system. I'm sure they are. Okay. But. Uh, all right. Well, sorry about that. I'll start with another question for you. Have you used the contracting cardiomyocyte assay to look at a larger set of compounds? Yeah, we actually tested um, a uh, commercially available uh, small library, the ScreenWell library from Enzo Life Sciences. It has uh, 131 different compounds. Uh, 107 compounds are different types of cardiotoxicity, and then there's 24 uh, uh, control non-toxic substance. Um, so we ran that on our system, and actually we saw uh, fairly nice results. We were getting uh, predictivities of almost 90% when using multiple parameters out of the assays. Uh, so um, some very, very encouraging results on, a, on giving us a small set of compounds. All right, Evan, here's another one. How long do you have to incubate the cardiomyocytes to see beating? Um, well, that's actually the important one. When you plate the cardiomyocytes, at least the ones we're using from uh, Cellular Dynamics, um, you'll see contractions in about you know three to four days, um, and then we typically wait seven to ten days to get um, a very good regular contraction rates over the whole well. Um, some other uh, researchers have been waiting 14 days and sometimes longer, and you do see an uh, increase in the contraction rate if you let them mature longer. Uh, so there are some benefits to doing that, but uh, again, we typically wait 7 to 10 days um, post-plating. All right, Vicki, we're going to move on to some questions for you. Um, this listener is wondering if this screening technique using the confocal microscope can be used in the suspension of cells such as leukemia. Since the cells won't be adhered to the bottom of the plate, is there a way to do the screening on the y-axis of each well? Thank you for your question. The answer is, the uh, first of all, the data that was presented today was actually captured on a wide-field high-content screening system, so it was not a confocal system. 
But the, the answer is yes, we can capture data uh, in the z-axis, so it's possible to image suspension, suspension cells in our wide field system, the Image Express Micro. We also do offer a confocal system, the Image Express Ultra, which was mentioned briefly at the end of the presentation. And with that system as well, you can definitely image suspension cells uh, and capture these stacks of those cells. So yes, with both of our high content screening systems, we can uh, capture data in Z. All right, Vicki, here's another one. What, or what is the typical runtime to capture an entire 96 well assay in two colors? Typically, in two colors, by capturing a single image per well, you can image an entire 96 well plate in, two, in three to four minutes. Okay, and then how frequently do customers need to use a custom analysis method, a custom module or journal, versus a turnkey application module to analyze their images? Typically, the majority of applications that we see, especially in screening labs, can be addressed using a turnkey application module. With the custom module editor, we now offer the flexibility to build on the capabilities of the pre-configured modules. Together, we can address about 90 to 95% of most customers' analysis needs, and the remainder of those can be addressed um, with a custom script and journal. So we do offer that comprehensive analysis package so that you have the flexibility to cover all of your analysis needs, but the majority of them will be covered uh, by our pre-configured modules or custom modules. Thank you, Vicki. Miguel, we're going back to you. We have so many questions for you. Um, this person says, uh, microRNAs increase proliferation. Can this lead to uncontrolled proliferation of other tissues or lead to tumor formation? Well, that is a, an important point, of course. We are addressing that uh, um, as we speak. So we are testing the effect of microRNAs in several uh, cancer cell lines and uh, other to see if we, if we can um, observe an increase in proliferation of other cells as well. Um, so far, all the data suggests that it's not the case. Okay. How does the expression of the microRNAs change between neonatal and adult animals? So we did analysis of microRNA expression in neonatal and, and neonatal and adult animals, and not surprisingly, what we have seen is that the microRNAs that increase proliferation in general uh, are reduced in, in adult animals compared to, to neonates. Yeah. All right, I have another proliferation question. Is the increased proliferation seen due to miRNA-mediated conversion of differentiated cardiomyocytes to a cardiac stem cell or to increasing the proliferation of already existing cardiac stem cells? So the, um, all the data that we have suggests that the effect of the microRNAs is through uh, promoting proliferation of already uh, existing cardiomyocytes. So, uh, so um, supporting these are the data that I've shown you using quiescent cells, using uh, adult uh, cells derived from adult animals, and we also have now some sulfate mapping experiments that uh, go along these, these lines as well. All right, we're moving on to another topic now. Have you measured target cell apoptosis in either your in vitro or your in, your, your in vitro or your in vitro miRNA targeting assays? Yes, we did measure apoptosis. I have not, did not have time to show you also these data. These data are in the in the paper, uh, and yes, these these microRNAs have no effect on on apoptosis or a decrease of apoptosis after infarction, for example. This was really a regeneration effect through increased proliferation. All right, Vicky, we're going to go back to you with that question 16 uh, that no one else wanted to tackle. Uh, do you have any CROs that use your system for cardiac talks on a fee-for-service basis? Can you comment on that? So we do have placements of our systems in uh, several contract research organizations or CROs. However, we don't have information on what services they offer, so I apologize that we don't have more detail on that. Thank you for clarifying that. Uh, unfortunately, our time is up. Uh, thanks for listening in, and thanks for the great 
Great questions. This webinar will be archived for six months on our website, www.genengnews.com. If you missed parts of it, you can watch it again or you can recommend it to friends and colleagues. Once again, I want to thank our panelists as well as our sponsor, Molecular Devices.